Hi and welcome to Cherry Talks Movies. Eric Blair, a journalist in the first half of the 20th century, gave us an interesting concept of the two-minute hate. It was in a novel he wrote under the pseudonym of George Orwell, I think called 1984. And people got out, collectively hated something for two minutes. So consider this video, my two-minute hate against science fiction movies that are horrible. Now, before I get started, if you like some of the movies I'm going to mention, that's okay. It's really, really fine. We can agree to disagree. But undoubtedly, if you're a science fiction fan, there are science fiction movies that you have little time for or actively have a rage against. And for me, this is going to be my one. We will start with one of the easy ones. In the year 2000, John Travolta had a vanity project called Battlefield Earth, based on one of a whole bunch of incredibly thick novels. And I mean thick in two senses of the word, both they were like that and they were stupid. They were incredibly good selling because they sold to two kinds of people. First one was people who didn't know what good science fiction was. And the second one was a whole bunch of Scientologists bought tons and tons of them gave them away uh, they gave them away at science fiction conventions i was at to try to get people to admit what they knew to be fact they want they gave them away because they wanted people to realize that l ron hubbard was one of the great science fiction writers of history he wasn't he was a shyster he was a con artist he was a sociopath he was everything bad about being a man in the 20th century and if people disagree with that i'm fine with that now battlefield earth i watched about 10 minutes of and couldn't watch any more you got like giant john travolta's with little tubes up his nose you got barry pepper a fine actor being totally wasted you've got the director roger christian doing all sorts of weird things with dutch angles and it's a tedious and turgid and really painful to watch movie i don't own a copy of it i did watch some of it on the streaming service back in the day but i didn't get through the whole lot a i consider the original author to be a repugnant human being in so many ways and his legacy of conning vulnerable people lives to this day with the organization he instigated some people may like it some people may be able to watch it ironically or comically or while self-medicating but for me it's a repugnant film that I don't want to waste any of my lifespan on beyond talking about it right now. Number two, any Disney science fiction films that were made before Disney bought up a whole bunch of other studios so it could make a science fiction films out of that studio's intellectual property. If you want a list of the bad Disney science fiction movies, there are a lot of them. There's Moon Pilot from 1962, there's The Absent Minded Professor, there's The Computer War Tennis Shoes, there's The World's Greatest Athlete, there's the black hole which is crazily bad it, it kind of wrote on the coattails of star wars and in order to do so it kind of cannibalized Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea where the bit where yvette mimure says they were searching for habitable life does get a bit of a chuckle but for the most part it's a total waste of good character actors like anthony perkins and robert forster and even yvette mimure and max william shell for that matter i mean you see him in judgment in Nuremberg you wonder about his life choices that led him to the black hole. And also it wastes a really nice little bit of a soundtrack by John Barry by overusing it to the extreme. It's a piece of shit, basically. Uh, I saw it at the cinemas with a whole bunch of science fiction fans and we spent dinner after we went to the cinema tearing it apart and explaining to each other just how bad it was. It was a useful autopsy and it helped me understand the difference between a good science fiction movie and a bad science fiction movie and the black hole for me will ever remain a bad science fiction movie made by a studio with a crappy track record number three and this is the one that's going to get the comments 2001 a space odyssey based on a story by arthur c Clarke, who also helped with the screenplay directed by stanley kubrick both of them have done good work and the technological innovations in telling this story on the screen i am not going to criticize breakthrough science fiction special effects really interesting production design but the story is really dull stanley kubrick and even arthur c clark didn't understand one important aspect of science fiction storytelling interesting characters they didn't have any in this you've got the two asteroids played by gary lockwood and keir Jule. you've got william sylvester playing haywood floyd you've got leonard rossiter being boring as one of the people on the space station and the story itself is thin 
as hell. Not only the device is kick-starting evolution of intelligent life, starts out in the Stone Age, of course, with pre-humans. Then in 2001, one of these alien devices on the moon starts sending signals out. People go to the moon. They they then find out there's another one at Jupiter. They go to Jupiter. The AI on the ship kills everybody except one of the astronauts. And that astronaut encounters the alien artifact, lives his life there, and becomes a giant space baby. That's it. That's all the story there is there. It's thin as hell. And yeah, I mean, it probably was wonderful to watch if you were self-medicating even though the special effects as i said and the set design production design all that kind of stuff is groundbreaking it's like having a beautiful fabergé egg and then when you open the egg there's a little tiny dog turd in the middle that's the problem with 2001 as far as i'm concerned 1968 when it came out science fiction writers and science fiction fans kind of knew that even though a lot of them were arthur c Clarke fans there was some criticism of how thin the story was. And there's been one of the ongoing problems with science fiction over the years. The pretty visuals obscure the fact that the characters are thin and the storytelling is rudimentary at best. Moving right along, I talked about this one last time around, Proximity from 2020. This is the kind of science fiction movie I hate and the kind of movie I hate because it's essentially dishonest. There's an implicit contract between movie makers and audiences. The audiences will pay money and invest part of their lives spent to watch what the movie maker makes and the other part of that contract is the movie maker is going to give them what they said they're going to give them and movies like proximity don't do that because it starts out as a science fiction movie it's about alien abduction and men in black and then suddenly we find out that the aliens are looking for jesus christ voila it's a piece of evangelism by fundamental christians here in australia Maybe 25% of people go to church, if that, on a regular basis. A lot of people are of other belief systems. A lot of people don't have any belief. And for a small group of people to decide that they're going to jam their belief system into the faces of audiences who came for one thing and received another is incredibly dishonest. That brings me to number five, which is the same kind of movie, basically. But it happened 70 years earlier. In 1952, there was a movie called Red Planet Mars where... People on Earth get signals from an alien intelligence on Mars. Voice from Mars explain things, and then it turns out that it's God. It stars Peter Graves, an actor so wooden, he was throughout his life endangered by termites. It's a black and white film, it's kind of low budget. And it's one of those ideas that people who don't know science fiction think is mind-blowing but is actually crazily dumb and prosaic. It's like, you know, two people crash land on an alien planet and they survive and they somehow get their shit together. There's a male and a female and they turn out to be Adam and Eve. It's that level of plotting and that level of what the hell is happening in this movie kind of movie making. So Red Planet Mars, it turned up a lot on late night television when I was a kid and I watched it a few years ago and it's bad. It's like leaving the door of the fridge open for two weeks, bad. And I will never watch it again for that reason. It's a waste of your lifespan. Next one from 2005, had potential. Story by Bray Bradbury. Pretty good idea. It was at the time when dinosaurs were really hot. And it's a movie from 2005 called A Sound of Thunder. Basically, people go back to prehistoric times and hunt dinosaurs. And they've got to do it at a t time and place when... It's not going to affect the future if they do that. So the dinosaurs are about to be destroyed as a volcano erupts in a pyroclastic flow and the dinosaurs are going to be roasted at 900 degrees centigrade within a few minutes. So the people kill the dinosaurs, happy little hunters, putting their marga hats on and, and that's basically the story. Except that one person accidentally crushes a butterfly and that butterfly causes a chain of changes when they go back to their own time. And the world is constantly changing and there's all these threats and all that kind of thing. Here's the problem. The plot doesn't hold up in the movie. Holds up in the story because Bradbury knew what he's doing. But in the movie, the way it's set up is there's no way that butterfly, had it not been crushed by the person who crushed it, was going to outrun the pyroclastic flow. So there would have been no change to the timeline. It doesn't take a script writer on the level of William Goldman to know that. It's and it's it's one of those movies where everything falls apart because one piece is missing. It wasn't particularly a good movie anyway. The special effects were very rudimentary. The actor was no better than it needed to be. 
but they had an intellectual property by Ray Bradbury. They thought they could monetize it. Didn't make a lot of money. And the thing, reason I hate the movie is that plot hole was fixable. There would have been a way to do it, but they chose not to. And that is the issue. Lazy script writing leading to lazy movie making, leading to a piss poor experience for an audience. Number seven, the Atlas Shrugged trilogy, based on the very, very, very fat novel by Ayn Rand. Here's the interesting thing about this one. In around 2010, a whole bunch of Tea Party types, remember the Tea Party types in America? A whole bunch of Tea Party types decided they were going to be fanboys and Ayn Rand stands and make a trilogy of movies based on her novel Atlas Shrugged. Now, Atlas Shrugged is a weird novel. It's about a woman called Dagny Taggart who runs a railway line. And she gets involved with a guy called John Galt and a group of individuals who are inventors and, and creators. And they decide that they're going to go on strike. So this is kind of her hip version of instead of the workers going on strike. The great minds of the 20th century, as it was in the novel, go on strike and everything collapses. And they all go to hide in a high-tech wonderland run by a guy called John Galt. This is all part of that great man theory of history rubbish, which a lot of people who are fans of Elon Musk subscribe to, even to this very day, and also a whole bunch of men's right advocates. It's a, it's a cesspool of people who need more help than they're getting. Now, the interesting thing is three movies were made in 2011, 2012, and 2014, and they had crazy low budgets, so there's a lot of green screen work, not done very well in these movies. There's a whole bunch of bad acting, not done very well. And in each of the three movies, a lot of the major characters are played by three different actors because they couldn't get the actors to return for the second and third films. And that's kind of hilarious. They, they do get some name actors who are well known to be on the right side of politics, let's say, to, to come in and do some stuff. And the whole plot, basically about Dagny Taggart running train lines and, and having a special kind of steel for the rails and all that kind of thing, is a plot line from the middle part of the 20th century, which they try to update to the 21st century, even though a lot of essential freight travels by air now, or by trucks, and the trains are kind of secondary to a, a lot of those modes of getting things around. Uh, you can watch these movies on Tubi if you choose to. I'd suggest you might not want to. But the three Atlas Shrugged movies are a whole bunch of people who aren't movie people but are ideologues from a certain political viewpoint who decided to make three films because they really loved a novel. In the same way John Travolta wanted to make Battlefield Earth because he really loved the novel. Not always the best thing to do, particularly when the novels aren't that great. Now, that isn't to say there isn't a good movie out of an Ayn Rand novel. If you watch The Fountainhead from 1949, I think it is, with Gary Cooper and Patricia Neal, that's got some wonderful bits in it. The Freudian symbolism in that is next-level fun. And it's one of those movies that is, has incredibly good actors and has incredibly good production design, but is also laughably bad. But the Atlas Shrugged trilogy is definitely not that. It is atrocious and has no redeeming features except for the fact that eventually it ends. Next one's pretty obvious. Um, from 2016, Passengers. That movie that has Jennifer Lawrence and it also has um, Chris Pratt in it where they're traveling to another solar system in a generation ship. Everybody's in cryogenic stasis while the ship travels the distance to this other star and this other planet. And one guy wakes up. And that guy is played by Chris Pratt, an actor who seems to have practiced all of his best acting moves in front of a mirror. So he's awake, everybody else is asleep. Nobody's going to be awake until after he dies. So he wanders around the spaceship for a couple of years and then he decides he's going to wake up the cute chick he sees in one of the cryogenic capsules, played by Jennifer Lawrence. And she's conned by him and gaslit by him into thinking that her capsule opened at random as well, until she finds out it didn't. And he is supposed to be the hero of the piece, and in the end of the movie they kind of make peace with each other and save the whole ship 
from a disaster that was unpredictable and that the computer running the ship couldn't handle. No, this guy made choices about the rest of a woman's life without her permission, just for his own satisfaction. That shouldn't happen in this century in a movie. I think it's crazily dishonest and to have him ultimately kind of kiss the girl at the end and they, they build a little garden and it all goes nicely in the end is repugnant. The movie makers shouldn't have made this movie. They should have looked at the script and gone, no, there's a big problem with this and the problem isn't going to go away. Nonetheless, the movie was made. It had two high-profile stars in it. I hate it because there's a redemption arc for a character who does something that, for me, is unforgivable. Number nine. We're up to number nine already. The Stepford Wives, 1975 and 2004. Based on a satirical little story by Ira Levin, The Stepford Wives is about a Connecticut suburb of Stepford where basically all of the women are being slowly replaced by robots because, surprise, they have minds of their own. You know, they they have, want to have lives of their own, they have their own aspirations that aren't necessarily in tune with those of their spouses. There's a kind of cautionary tale in the original story, but there's a really great chunk of William E. Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade, which tells you all the things that went wrong when director Brian Forbes was making this movie. He wanted his wife, Neuma, to star in it, and she um, didn't want to wear short skirts because she didn't have the legs for short skirts. So the kind of sexiness of the female robot characters, which is definitely a part of the satire in this, didn't happen because everybody wore long flowing skirts instead. There were other problems with the production. It's one of those situations where the filmmakers get an intellectual property, which could make a good film, and they excise everything that's useful in that story because they want to make a movie a certain way. They want to leave their mark on it. They want to do it their way. And uh, William Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade gives us a real reason why there needs to be some kind of control, particularly on a film's director. It is a cautionary tale. There is a creepy ending to it as well. I hate what Brian Forbes did to the movie just so his missus could get a gig. I think that's... Is that nepotism when you give your wife a job as well as your kids? You shouldn't do that. You're playing with other people's money. You're also playing with an audience who expects certain things out of a film. And you're choosing to ruin it because of your own ego and your own domestic harmony. That then brings me to number 10, which is the Avatar films. Now again, like 2001, the Avatar films are breakthrough as far as filmmaking technology is concerned and the instrumentalities used to create a film. All credit to James Cameron for that. They are exceptional. But what he did with them is essentially made an anime. Both of the Avatar films are motion capture animes. And the stories are not stories that are new. They are stories we've heard before a lot of times. And it's just told in a different format on a different planet. Using breakthrough computer technologies. But not telling us anything new. The ideas of colonization and, and the disenfranchising indigenous cultures is one that's been told a number of different times, a number of different ways. And it's been told by better storytellers than James Cameron. Even Dances with Wolves tells it pretty well. We have a whole new genre of Australian films where indigenous people are talking about the effects of colonization and disenfranchisement of indigenous cultures in their own ways, and they're doing it in a bunch of different genres as well. But James Cameron's Avatar films, they're ordinary at the core of them. Yes, they look spectacular, and yes, they look wonderful. We get Brendan Cowell, an Australian actor playing an Australian character, who is the one of the worst depictions of an Australian character since Paul Hogan stopped making movies. Success disguises the thinness of a plot. So a movie that looks really good is going to get a lot of audience in and they're all going to go wow and, and love it the way that a baby loves a toy hung over a cradle. And the Avatar movies are incredibly successful from a corporate point of view. But as far as moving human culture along and as far as moving movie making along in an important storytelling sense, they don't. But they simply look pretty and even though they do have Sigourney Weaver in them and some other good character actors I'm reluctant to say this about an Australian actor but I don't think Sam Worthington's got the grunt to hold a movie together I think that he's good in certain kinds of roles 
but I don't think that his skills at this stage of his life and his career are sufficient for a viewpoint character in movies that are making billions of dollars. Then there's the other problem of a cultural appropriation, you know, white guys who go into big blue aliens with dreadlocks in an African style and facial makeup that imitates First Nations cultures from around the world. There's a bit of cultural appropriation there as well. But just to summarize on science fiction movies I hate, there are any number of science fiction movies I love, and I could talk about them in the future if you want me to. But I think that calling out the bullshit is as important as calling out the cool stuff. And these movies all are less than their potential. And that, I think, is the problem. Those Disney science fiction movies of the 60s and the 70s had a kind of white, middle American worldview, which is, of course, part of the Disney brand at the time, which really irks me as somebody from a different culture. Most of those Disney movies, with the exception of things like The Black Hole, are comedies, but they are incredibly bad comedies. They don't have the vital spark that a proper screwball comedy has. They're kind of lowbrow, low-target, dumb movies. And yes, they would have appealed to a certain audience that wasn't particularly sophisticated, old, or educated. But if you watch them from a modern viewpoint, they have not aged well. They have aged like cheese left in the sun. And I think that's the issue that I have with them most of all. Anyway, that's it for this time around. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment, and hit the notification bell. If you dislike any of my choices, happy to discuss it in the comments. We're having a lot of fun in the comments at the moment. You can also support the channel if you choose to by donating at patreon.com slash paleocinema, becoming a patron. You can also buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash paleocinema. Next time around, I should have some things coming in the mailbox. They've been delayed. It's taken about two weeks for mail to get from one city to the other here in Australia. And that's delaying some of the stuff that I really want to show you and really want to talk about the movies on. But I'm hoping that they arrive next week and that I can open the packages and enjoy them. So in the meantime, watch some good movies. Don't watch some bad movies. Treat yourself this week. Watch only good movies. And I'll catch you next time.